Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our adventure in the Cold Bog with the Cult of Jinx. Before we jump in, I just wanted to mention that this episode was pre-recorded pretty much as soon as the last one went up, which means I won't be able to address any of the comments today, but I will of course still read them, and if I've missed anything or someone mentioned a great idea, then I will get on that next time. Now, last time we left off, after acquiring another piece of info about the Horn of Edmo, we still don't have a location yet, but considering that this was, I believe, the third quest relating to the Horn, we should be getting close. Before we continue the hunt, however, it is time for some slight adjustments around the base. As you can see, we have laid down the plans for a new building on top of what was once a rice field, because I think we could use the space for something more worthwhile. As Redini begins the construction, we also receive a quest that might be of interest. The Empire is asking us to guard a person named Randy, hopefully not a sign of things to come, although the quest itself seems pretty easy. Randy suffers from paralytic abasia and must be kept in bed, and if we can keep him there for 9 days, we will receive one of the rewards below. So all we need to do really is to feed someone for 9 days, and we can get a masterwork bed in return, I think that's a deal worth taking. Before we do though, let's first complete the construction of what is actually going to be Coco's new home. So we are moving her art bench and her jade slab bed in here, as her previous chambers will now become a storage room for dead animals, because I don't think that it's a good idea to leave them outside all the time. Just in that moment, we are also informed that the Anima Tree is ready for another linking ritual, so let's give Spex her next Psycaster level and hope she gets something good. Although at level 4 there is really only one ability that I don't consider particularly useful, so unless we get very unlucky here we should be fine. We are also having ourselves yet another Woodmaker Dryad, and as always we now need to pick a name from the list of patron supporters in the naming rights tier and above, and so our new Dryad will from now on go by the name of Exa. Maniac and Took meanwhile have spotted another Mega Sloth, and because last episode's hunting trip was apparently not enough, they are now going to shoot it down with their great bows. The heavy fur will make for some nice leather armor, and the meat will keep everyone well fed for the next few days. Later that evening then, Spex finishes the linking ritual and advances to Psycaster rank 4. We also regrow one patch of anima grass, but more importantly, Spex now learns Skip, a very versatile ability that can be useful both in and outside of combat, and next to Smoke Pop it is one of my favorites at this rank. On the following morning, we are then moving a suspicious bedroll into our animal storage room before we accept the quest to guard Randy. Again, I really can't see a reason why we shouldn't. Redini now hauls our new guest into his, well, not so accommodating chambers, but the guy is paralyzed anyway, so there's not much he can do about it, and he is still a prisoner after all. His stats are looking pretty good however, double passion in both combat skills, good with plants and animals, and a total plus 40% work speed bonus from the hard worker neurotic trait. I have to admit, I am tempted to just recruit him and fail the quest, but please let me know what you think we should do here. He won't be able to make himself useful for another 31 days, and he also has a few pre-existing injuries, but still his skills and traits look really good, and missing out on the quest reward seems worth it for that. But again, let me know what you think about it, and in the meantime, let us give out another name, this time to Spex's new medicine maker dryad, Bash. I will admit that would have been a very fitting name for one of those bark skins, but that's the luck of the draw, I'm sure that Bash here will be just as useful in their role as a medicine maker. Now, since we are on a naming spree already, let us conduct another Festival of Trees ritual next, in the hopes of not only obtaining one or two more ideology development points, but also to perhaps recruit another colonist, there is a 50% chance of that happening after all if the ritual is successful. And with a quality of 95%, the chances of that happening are pretty good, so let's have our cultists build themselves some sky lanterns, watch as they are launching them into the sky above the swamp, and hope for a good result. Mm. 
And indeed, there we are, we gain another ideology development point for a beautiful festival of trees, a new recruit is waiting to join us as well, and that title of two mechanics sounds promising, and we also attracted some friendly visitors with our lanterns. So it looks like the Cult of Jinx is slowly spreading over to other factions, and we will trade with them in just a moment, but first, let us welcome our latest recruit to the colony. For a change, Liviana now receives another male member, only its third one, and he will from now on be known as Armando, of course once again named after a generous Patreon supporter. Now, Armando's skills are looking pretty damn good if you ask me. A double passion level 14 crafting skill is absolutely fantastic, and he might even be able to take care of some research for us if he isn't crafting, although I doubt that is going to be the case for quite some time. Trigger Happy and Kind are also some solid traits, yes he won't be as accurate with a bow, but at least he will shoot fast, so perhaps we can also equip him with some throwables, we'll see about that. Health-wise we are looking at the mandatory ritual scar and unfortunately also at some asthma, but that only consumes one herbal medicine once every 7 days and should not be too much trouble if we can keep it in that minor stage. So all in all I really like what I'm seeing here. Although this does now also mean that we need to rearrange the base once more, because Armando of course needs a bedroom. And so our prisoner will quickly move back to our original prison, right next door to our two grizzly bears, Vladimir and Dr. Thunder, and we construct ourselves a small makeshift shack next to the kitchen to house our dead animals in the meantime. Armando then gets a comfortable pigskin bedroll for now, I believe this one might actually contain some original pigskin from Fatty McCool, so he should feel honored to be given this valuable piece of Liviana's history. With everything set up for the night, Redini can now approach our guests, although their lack of funds and tradable goods make it a bit difficult to pull off anything exciting here, and so we just sell them a component and two doses of Luciferium before we send them on their way again. And as they are leaving, they also leave behind a small gift for us, 23 units of gold, I think that is a lovely gesture to honor the birthplace of the Cult of Jinx. On the next morning then, things are getting interesting in the swamp. It has been quite some time since the last one, but Liviana is once again under attack, and this time we are dealing with drop pots. Now luckily, the raiders here are landing all over the place and will therefore hopefully not attack all at once, but still, this is our first raid with proper guns, so I am a little anxious to see how this goes. At the very least, it is going to be extremely heavy on the micromanagement, so I apologize in advance if I won't be able to show all parts of the find at once. To get us started, Maniac and Armando can take on the raider who landed closest to our base, and luckily we did have enough time to get into cover here. At the same time, our small band of followers has run into a few of the other attackers, which is good for us, but probably not so good for them. We also have a woman with an incendiary launcher approaching from the north, but Redini is already waiting to ambush her, while the bulk of our forces is set up to the south, waiting for the enemies to cross the river. Zoomed out, we can see most of that simultaneously, and we can also see Maniac and Armando take out the first enemy. Down south, attacker number two also falls quickly, but unfortunately not before landing a shot on Took. So far though, it's nothing life-threatening, so let's jump up north, where Redini is now rushing the woman with the incendiary launcher to make sure that she doesn't set anything on fire. Redini has no armor at the moment, but it also looks like she doesn't need it, at least for now. To the south, meanwhile, more and more enemies are approaching, but a good number of them only have knives, so it's not as bad as it looks. Additionally, we can also use Spex's new vertical pulse ability to send two of the raiders puking all over the place, so for now the situation should be under control. One attacker did manage to advance towards our Gauranlin trees, however, and is now engaged in a fight with one of our dryads. We do have backup arriving though, and Maniac is also already shooting them. And so they quickly go down, and that means the rest of the attackers are now all concentrated near our southern entrance, so we are moving our forces over there as well. Our right flank is a bit unprotected at the moment, you can see that we're going to place some sandbags to change that, but still, for the most part, it looks like we have the upper hand here. To take care of that flanker on the right, we can now use Spex's new skip ability and just teleport them out of cover and directly out into the open in front of us, which quickly gives us the kill and sends the rest of the enemies fleeing. 
So all in all, this definitely could have gone much worse. The injuries to Redini and Took are nothing to worry about right now, and we did even get lucky if you want to call it that, as the small trade caravan was completely annihilated and left behind some pretty cool stuff. One of their members is still alive though, and they are a follower of Jinx and also helped out in the fight, so I feel like it's only fair that we now save their life in return. And even without medicine, it looks like they will live, which can unfortunately not be said for Woodmaker Dryad Exar. With a cut off ear and a substantial wound to the head, Exa is only going to last for 8 more hours, so we are going to wait for the next wood drop in 5 and then put Exa in a healing pot to recover. In the meantime, Jekna finishes what is likely going to be her last leather armor for quite some time, but it is of good quality, so we are now putting it on Colony Founder's specs and give her old bearskin armor of poor quality to Redini. From here, Armando now takes over the tailoring bench and begins with a proper outfit for himself, while Maniac unlocks the secrets of the Great Bow, just as Redini carries our injured ally into the village. That means we can now make the best bow in the game ourselves, and we will also stop researching for now, as there is a lot to do around the base. Before we get to that, however, a psychic drone adds to our worries, and of course it once again affects all females. With a lovely minus 30 to their mood, we can only hope that this passes quickly, because we have some pretty extensive building planned. To continue the fortification of our base, we are now walling off the south, and because of the swampy terrain, we actually need to get a bit creative with that. So we are not only erecting a barrier towards the river, but in fact also a wall on the river, so that enemies have to stay in the water as they move towards us. That will be quite the resource and labor intensive project though, so we'll see whether or not we can finish it in today's episode. The night then at least remains uneventful, apart from Armando making himself a great bow to replace his poor quality pistol, and you know what happens to things that we don't need, they get tossed in the river. So it looks like our cult of tree lovers is on a great path to also become ocean polluters, perhaps we should not look too closely at that. As the next morning rolls around and Coco sets out for another training session with our bears, we also have a drop of cargo pods coming in. Conveniently enough, they land right next to the base and contain a few components that we'll gladly pick up. And on the topic of components and technology in general, I would like to pose a question here as we watch a mostly unspectacular day pass by. I have played around with the idea of keeping the Cult of Jinx completely tribal until we get to the first checkpoint in the ideology, for which we need to increase the colony wealth up to 350,000 silver, or about 7 times what we currently have. Now I really like the idea of focusing purely on Neolithic tribalism for that first stage, then moving on to industrial tech for the second and finally going all out with fancy space attack for the third act, but I'm also a little afraid that we simply won't survive once raids get a bit bigger, as long as we don't step up our tech game. We are already at a point where 40 to 50 person tribal raids could theoretically happen if we get unlucky, and yes, we are pretty well equipped and have a few good psychasts, but still, a raid like that would probably completely overrun the village. So my question is, would you also like to see that three-part act unfold within the framework of the new ideology ending, or do you think we should switch to better weapons much earlier? I personally feel like a low-tech playstyle can be valid as long as colony wealth is low, it's around 50,000 right now if I remember correctly, but unfortunately the ideology ending is directly tied to colony wealth, so there is no way around increasing that substantially sooner or later. Now we don't need to decide on that right away, but as the colony grows I think we have to look at the very real possibility that a purely tribal cult of Jinx might have some trouble staying alive as the series progresses. Of course, we could also try to find creative ways that would allow us to stay tribal for longer and still be able to defend ourselves, a good number of psycasters or a small army of bears could be such things, and if you have additional ideas then I would be very happy if you could leave them in the comments, as this would definitely be my preferred way of doing it. Honestly, keeping a 350,000 wealth colony alive purely on Neolithic and medieval tech would be one hell of an accomplishment, and if we can somehow pull it off on this difficulty setting, then I would be absolutely ecstatic. So feel free to discuss how we should deal with all of this, and in the meantime, let's get back to the game. 
Our exterior wall is coming along nicely. Food does also not seem to be an issue any longer, as we are actually starting to swim in berries right now. Jackna now has some free time to use her artistic skills for another sculpture, and all things considered, life in the swamp is pretty good right now. The trees are also slowly starting to show their new leaves, and hopefully that is a sign that warmer temperatures are imminent. And so we jump ahead to yet another day in the cold bog that we begin by switching around some rooms again. Coco will now move into Jackna's old room to be a bit closer to her Gauranlin trees and the bears. Jackna will move into our new art workshop, which also has the stone cutting bench conveniently placed right outside. Armando will occupy Jackna's former room with the tailoring bench. And finally, Redini will move into the Fatty Cool bedroll to be close to our patient. By the way, Redini has also started converting our prisoner, because even if we decide to complete the quest, I think the least we can do is convince them of our ways. I am also a bit sad that we were unable to capture any of the attackers from the drop pod raid, but at the very least their bodies can now keep our bears from getting hungry. Up next, we are then celebrating the birth of yet another muffalo calf, and I think we are getting close to the point where we might want to put a stop to that. For now though, Tap joins the herd, which should probably get a slightly larger pen soon. Armando's crafting skill of 14 meanwhile allows him to make himself an excellent quality face mask, so that he can now switch to the same grey one as the others. And yes, I have not forgotten about that styling station that allows us to change the colour of clothing items like this, but for now let's get one building project completed before we begin the next. Speaking of which, our southern wall is coming along nicely, but like I said, it is a sizable project, and I think it's okay if we don't finish it all in one episode. Jack now meanwhile has finished her work for the day, the creation of a large marble sculpture, and this one depicts Coco as she tames a muffalo, apparently by whispering into its ear and sending it into a hypnotic state. So, all of you talented artists out there, feel free to capture that moment yourself. Jackna's rendition meanwhile will, very fittingly I think, go in Coco's bedroom. And speaking of fan art, I think with the construction of a few more sandbags near the river here, we have reached a good point to make the cut for today. The Cult of Jinx has survived another winter it seems, but their time out here in the swamp is not getting any easier, and we'll have to see how we deal with that. And while we think about that, let us enjoy some more wonderful artwork, starting with this piece from KB Dragon Arts. This refers to that sculpture that Coco made in the second to last episode, episode 14, showing Thoraya freezing to death under a blue moon. You might remember that sculpture for also featuring thousands of artichokes, while this rendition here only features one, and I think that is a perfectly valid decision. Up next, we also have something new from Chryseor, who titled this piece We went exploring and all we got was three packages of herbal medicine, likely referring to one of our recent expeditions in an ancient ruin. So thank you very much to both of you, and of course, if you have some artwork to share as well, then feel free to just send me an email to pete at petecomplete.com, that way we can keep the artwork nice and uncompressed. For today, let's wrap things up right here. If you enjoyed the episode, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.